Welcome to the College of Public Service. Uh, we're really excited to have you here. Uh, I think this is going to be an amazing Vital Voices. I'm going to tell you a little bit to start out with about the College of Public Service. Uh, we have social work, we have education, and we have criminal justice. So we really think about things like the school to prison pipeline and how to create change in our community. UHD is the second largest university in Houston, and we're the most diverse, not only in Texas, but in the South. So we really pride ourselves on uh, our amazing students and training students to go out and make a difference in the world. I'm very excited about this presentation because uh, it's, it's given by one of my good friends and colleagues, Dr. Ruth Lopez, who I'm really excited to listen to, and my new friend and colleague, Dr. Rhoda Freeland. So uh, welcome to Vital Voices, and I'm going to hand it over for the introduction to our center director, Stephen Villano. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this Vital Voices session. Um, as you know, for any of you that have been following us, we've had quite a few Vital Voices sessions this, this semester, and we are going to have two more coming up. We're going to have our Social Work Persons of the Year presentation, and that is on uh, Thursday, March 24th. And that will be, um, we will be honoring Dr. Peter Hotez and Dr. Elena Batazzi. Um, the, they have developed a vaccine that is available, will be available, is already available to people worldwide, a, a vaccine that is low cost vaccine. Uh, in fact, they're, they're being nominated for the Nobel Prize for that. So we'll have them as our guests. And then on uh, Tuesday, March 29th, we will be hosting uh, uh, Houston Council Member Mike Knox, and he's going to talk about his nonconformist approach to life. He is a UHD alum. So those are the two things that we have coming up to close out our Vital Voices season this year. And now I would like to introduce you to, to our two speakers for the evening, and they are uh, Dr. Ruth M. Lopez, and she is an assistant professor in the Department of Education Leadership and Policy Studies in the College of Education at the University of Houston. Her research examines educational policies and practices that impact the experiences of students of color, the education of immigrant and undocumented students, and the issues of equity and access at all levels of education for Latinx students. Dr. Rhoda Freeland is an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies in the College of Education at the University of Houston. Her research is connected to two specific areas, the exploration of educational inequality rooted in various forms of systemic oppression and the demographic, and I'm sorry, and the democratic engagement of families, youth and community members in the life of schools and district governance. So with that, we are very pleased and honored to have these two ladies with us tonight. And I will turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and for having us here at the University of Houston downtown, uh, virtually at least uh, to our neighbors. I'm going to uh, put up our slideshow. So just um, give me one second so that I can get that working before we get started. I, I should say, excuse me for interrupting, but I should say that uh, to those of you who are watching online, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box uh, if you'd like. And if you have uh, comments that you want to share, you can share them in the chat box as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm going to actually open the chat box too so that and the Q&A. So we do want to make this interactive. So we welcome you to um, to um, we have a few spots where we'll ask for you for questions and that sort of thing. So again, welcome. My name is uh, Ruth Lopez, and I'm again I'm an assistant professor in the K-12 educational leadership at the University of Houston. And I'll pass it to Dr. Freeland. Hi, and I'm Rhoda Freeland, um, an assistant professor in that same department with Ruth. And we're really excited to be here to share um, some work we've been thinking about. Um, we both teach courses on family and community engagement to our master's students and our doctoral level students in the EDD program. And um, we focus this talk today uh, based on some of the, the, the dialogue that we're having in our classes, but also some writing we're doing around how to teach around these issues for aspiring uh, school leaders and aspiring district leaders. Um, 
And so we both are going to share some work that we've done um, in the past before we arrived at Houston that looks at family and community engagement from a number of uh, different vantage points. But we're also going to share some of like the cutting edge work that we're talking about in our courses that um, is kind of like on the edge and pushing us to think and shift paradigms about families and communities and how we kind of authentically engage them in the life of the school and, 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 and in decision-making. Thank you so much. Um, and I do see some of our students in the, in the, in the attendees. So welcome, <laughs> welcome to you all. Um, we do wanna again hear from uh, who's in the room. Um, and we're gonna, again, we're gonna leave time for discussion, but please feel free to use the Q and A. Um, Steven, thank you so much. He's helping us out with monitoring that at any time as well. And so one of the things that we wanna do is just start by, by acknowledging um, the context, the reality, right? Um, that there are intersecting societal crises such as like racial injustice, the fact that we're living in a pandemic that has um, affected non-dominant communities in disproportionate ways. You know, you hear the statistics of black and Latinx uh, families that have um, had higher rates of COVID, more deaths, high job loss. And so we know that this impacts schools and communities. And so acknowledging that very, that very factor first. Um, and, you know, a lot of the work that we shared about, we will share about took place prior to that pandemic, but we also want to share new work that, that is taking place now. So in a way, like reimagining what's possible as well. Um, and, and because these have been the most impacted communities, um, that's who we're going to focus on today for our presentation. We want to elevate the ways that family and community concerns help advance educational equity. Um, and in addition to, to those two points that Ruth just talked about, we really also want to get into stereotypes about families and, and move beyond kind of these deficit, deficient conceptions of families, non-dominant families in particular, uh, families who are most marginalized in the educational um, system and in other social systems in, in the broader society and take a more strength-based approach <laughs> to thinking about the contributions these families make. And we also are not trying to gloss over the challenges associated with authentically engaging families and communities. This is tough work. I mean, you can read some articles and some brochures that will give you a list of things that you can do in your school and it will make it feel and seem easy. <laughs> but there are a lot of tensions that are, are brought to this work and we wanna surface some of those in our discussion and engagement with you today. And then we also wanna kind of leave on a hopeful note <laughs> and talk about what the research, what the current research is saying about um, how to build authentic and equitable collaborations between schools, families, and communities. And I should say that when we talk about uh, schools, families, and communities, we're inclusive of youth as well who are leaders in their own right and have a voice and a clear educational stake in what we as adults decide should be um, happening in schools. And so school improvement efforts, we take the stance that school improvement efforts should also include um, the voices of young people as well. And so this, you know, we're getting into some, some territory we're gonna talk about a little bit about terminology, just so we have some shared. <laughs> Um, language about what we're talking about today. So I think a lot of scholars in the field, as well as practitioners out and about, interchange these terms a lot. They're, they're used in a, interchangeably. Involvement is sometimes conflated with engagement, which is sometimes conflated with partnership, which is sometimes um, supposed to mean collaboration as well. But there's some clear um, lines in the literature about the differences between these terms. And so we want to kind of like just tease those out a little bit today in some of the, the work we're going to share. But um, typically involvement is um, considered like very, a little bit distant from a true partnership or a true collaboration in that the school and the goals of the involvement or the relationship building are centered around the priorities set by the school. And so 
then parents, community members, young people come in and plug into these existing structures and ways of thinking about um, engagement. And the reason why the field has been pushing uh, to, to, to move beyond this is because there are instances where this can become like a checkbox, a checklist of things that actually um, can divide the community and decide who's a good parent or who's a, a not so supportive parent if they don't attend various events, if they haven't um, participated in these school specified goals. And so the field is, is really moved beyond uh, family involvement as a key goal and has really started to talk more and more about engagement. And so engagement, what does that mean? If it's different than involvement, what does it mean? Um, this is more of like beyond the surface relationships. Um, it elevates the role of parents in the life in the decision-making and the work of the school. And, and, and now there are scholars who are even arguing that that's not good enough. <laughs> and it's like, how can we keep up? So now we are seeing scholars pushing the field and we're gonna talk about this more at the end to think about more equitable collaborations. And there's a scholar named Annie Shimaru who has a great book um, that we have a link to the resources about called Just Schools, where she talks about how you build more equitable collaborations. And these equitable, equitable collaborations are important because they tend to address issues of power asymmetries that are inherent in family, community, school relationships. And they take into context some of these bigger societal challenges that might impact um, family and community engagement practices. So more equitable collaborations, not uh, centering kind of the, the issues and the concerns that families have, but they're doing it in a way that, that breaks down barriers. And I wanted to, we have this lovely photo <laughs> here um, that Ruth is gonna talk about. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeland. Um, so yeah, this photo is actually, um, I am and I'm holding my little one in the pink shirt down on the bottom right. And this is at our uh, school garden that a friend and I uh, sort of revamped at Burnett Elementary, which is in the East End of Houston. It's a school my, child, my two children attend. It's a dual language school. And so um, the garden, I think it, it's, it's, other people have been engaged in it before the pandemic, but you know, everything had to come to a halt um, during the pandemic. And so we just, you know, got um, our hands dirty. We got in the dirt and, and the principal was just super supportive and excited about us um, starting to come out to the garden and slowly but surely we're getting more family. So what I love about the photo is that it's got staff, it's got the administrator, the principal's photo, it's got children, you know, what Dr. Freeland was talking about in terms of youth um, being uh, leaders too, right? Uh, we have the children and we have uh, parents as well. So it really is a community effort. And so again, it's kind of connecting it back to um, the context, right? This has been, I don't know, it's been, it's been a great source of joy for my family in particular, especially, you know, the fact that we're still in a pandemic and we're just continuing to see ways to, to even keep collaborating with the community. So it's, a, it's still a baby project, but I wanted to highlight it. Right, but what I, I just wanna add that what I love yeah, about this is that it is, it is the example of moving beyond involvement because even though involvement practices, traditional involvement practices are necessary for relationship building, they don't often sustain an effort such as this. And so mm -hmm. you need that groundwork to happen to do something that this is, that is more centered on community needs, community concerns, and kind of like this full engagement uh, across role and responsibility within the school as well as the community. So I, I, I'm glad she was willing to share this photo. Thank you. Yeah, you're so right, because it is located within a food desert, right? And so you think about what you were just saying in terms of what are these societal issues, these inequities that exist in communities and how can families play a role in, in addressing some of these issues and really um, fixing you know, some of these issues that exist. So definitely is one of those. Uh, uh, 
Rhoda, you mentioned earlier that there was a survey that came out. Is um, is this where it's relevant to mention about that finding? Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, I will forget. Um, <laughs> but there, there's a National Association of Family and Community Engagement um, that recently released uh, a survey, survey findings from their preparation, uh, educator and administrator preparation programs. And one of the things that they found is that most of the programs that were surveyed are attending to the needs and concerns around diverse families, which is promising, right? Because we know we have seen massive demographic shifts in the public school system in this country. And so the fact that there are educator and preparation pr programs and administrator preparation programs that are tending to these kind of demographic patterns that we're seeing is exciting. But one of the things that they found is that a lot of these programs aren't necessarily addressing issues of parents as leaders and uh, equitable collaborations between families and schools and communities. And so that's an area of growth. And when we saw that, when I saw this this morning, I was excited to tell Dr. Lopez about it because she basically, I was like, we're doing this in our class. So what you're getting today is kind of like a little snippet of what we like to talk about in our class. So if you're one of our students, you know, this feels redundant, but if you're one of, uh, if you're not one of our students, you think of it as a free course because we talk <laughs> about these issues in our class and we bring up not just the traditional family and community engagement patterns and everything we know about from what the research says in the field, but we're pushing our students to think about um, kind of like parents and community members and young people coming to you um, with some area of expertise in some, some leadership capabilities. And if you marry that with your own expertise as educators and administrators, wow, that's kind of a pretty powerful dynamic duo. And so um, I, when we saw that, it was kind of like confirmation that we're not just crazy ladies who are <laughs> making our students read all these different articles about um, community organizing and leadership, but we are actually um, uh, uh, tapping into a need for, to prepare uh, future school and district leaders. Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks for letting me put you on the spot. <laughs> Um, so we want to know who's here. You know, I think that was a perfect point to, to segue into this, you know, learning who's in the room, uh, if you will. If we were in a big auditorium, of course, we would uh, make it so that we would ask you all to, to speak. But if you don't mind in the chat, the chat is enabled. And so if you could just tell us what your role is. Are you assistant principal? Are you a teacher, a district leader, social worker, a student? Um, and if you want to, feel free to share. Let us know why what we've presented so far, what the session is about today. Why does it interest you? Like, why are you here today? Because we do want to take a second to just review that and, and hopefully touch on some of um, what you all have said in the chat. So I'll, I'll stop here and let the chat go. Feel free, please, and please take a look at everyone else's responses too. So Mary Beecher is asking, um, the preparation is great for the evolving leaders and staff going through prep programs, but how do we capture the training for the current leaders in place? Mary asking the tough questions. Um, mm. She knows us, so she's trying to put us on the spot. She no, does she, know us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like yeah, this is a great an question. incredible question, and it's a very important one. I mean, we talk about kind of... Uh, professional development for teachers all the time. And we talk about instructional culture, all these things we feel like educators, people who are in front of young people need, but how much do we uh, offer support for leaders who are in the moment engaging in this type of work? Uh, I don't think we do a very good job of this at, in the field, but I think that there are some national organizations like the one I mentioned earlier, some conferences, that are uh, reasonable um, if you could get away from your school <laughs> to attend where you can connect with other school leaders who are trying to be community engaged uh, school and district leaders. Because um, I think you're lucky, Mary, that you're in this program and you have access to Dr. Lopez and myself, but you're right, not all of your peers do. Mm -hmm. 
I wanted to say, I mean, I am, um, I am Mary's uh, doctoral advisor, and I want to, I want to say this is a great thesis opportunity uh, topic because I think it is really important to figure out how to capture um, the training, you know, in place. Um, and and I know that just from teaching these courses, and I've even learned from you, Mary, um, like the require, you know, the requirements that certain responsibilities have, especially if you're in a Title One school, like where family engagement is a requirement, right, um, of this funding. Um, but what about those schools that don't fit within that window or even at those schools that have that designation? Like, how do you capture how family engagement is being valued? Because I think Dr. Freeland and I would argue that doesn't matter the demographics of the school and whether it's designated as a Title I or not, like family engagement and community engagement should be a priority. Um, so um, definitely, I think that's a really good question that we can, I want to keep it in my mind as we keep going. So thank you for, thank you for asking that. And it seems like we have district folks here, we have administrators, we have various various districts represented, um, higher ed, I mean, um, uh, um, scholars as well. That's great. Um, I love that we have a homeschool mom. That's awesome. <laughs> that's amazing. Yes, and student at the same time. Yes. <laughs> and then community focus for after school program. Um, the social work student. And then a uh, bilingual education. And I will share that we are gonna share um, a resource list at the very end. And so we've put together, if we cite any studies um, and some of our own work as well. So we'll be sharing um, some resources. I, I, I can't really quite figure out how to share the link in here, but we have a QR code and I don't want to get rid of the presentation if I do that. So, uh, but it definitely is coming. I, I trust me. So, okay. I think this is great. So thank you so much um, for it, taking the time to introduce yourself. Um, it's exciting to have, um, and feel free if you haven't had a chance, just we're going to continue, um, you know, keeping an eye on the chat. So if, um, if you have any ideas that come up or you didn't have a chance to introduce yourself with, please, uh, yet, yeah, so please feel free to go in there. So I'll keep, keep us going in here. So um, this work is personal. This work, the, we, you know, we didn't just sort of like come and become professors holding PhDs and said, you know, we wanna work on education. Let's, let's focus on this topic. It really, it's, it's, a journey that I think has been through life for us. And so we wanted to spend some time, it's something that we, again, incorporate into our teaching is talking about who we are and why we're interested in this work. And so, um, so this, you know, we're titling this, who shaped us, our community cultural wealth. And the, the terminology of community cultural wealth comes from Dr. Tara Yasso, uh, Y-O-S-S-O. -S -S and again, we're gonna share the link to her article at the end of the meeting, but, um, she came up with this framework called community cultural wealth. And it really was one of, and this is in 2005. And it really, I wanna say is one of the first times where there was a focus specifically on Chicano families, but it's really been taken up by you know, numerous communities, probably even internationally is one of the most cited articles I would say in education and particularly when it comes to equity issues. And she put forward this uh, community cultural wealth and she outlined different forms of uh, wealth that come from non-dominant communities. So these forms of wealth um, may have not been recognized before, right, um, in more formal spaces, but they existed there. So she's arguing that there's this sort of like genius that exists in communities that often isn't noticed. And so these kinds of community cultural wealth are linguistic. You think about multilingual families or the ability to code switch um, and do that while navigating multiple spaces. Um, aspirational capital, which is this idea of like keep going in spite of like the hardships that you might face um, in life, that it doesn't, it doesn't um, diminish your drive to keep going. Navigational capital, sort of like figuring out how to navigate institutions and you know, she argues that non-dominant families are experts at this. Um, social capital, which I think folks are familiar with. And familial capital, which you see our mothers here. So we're gonna talk about our familial capital a bit and also resistant capital. So like resistant, I could say like sometimes when institutions like education say, you know, you're not, you're, you're not, we're not gonna push your child to go to college or, you know, maybe you're not um, 
tracked in, in the higher tracks. And so resistant capital is like saying, yeah, I do have a right to an education and a good one at that. And so, um, you know, I'm just kind of giving you a very simplified two minute version of this framework, but it, it really not only guides the slide that we're going to talk about right now, but it guides a lot of the work we do and it guides some of the stories that we're going to share with you in a little bit. But um, we're each going to share a little bit of our narratives and in order to show you how this, um, you know, how this played out in our own lives. And so uh, I really acknowledge my mother in, in, in my, my being able to sit here in front of you all today as Dr. Ruth Lopez holding a PhD um, and her work and advocacy for me uh, from early education and and talking to Dr. Freeland, she's going to share her story in a little bit, but without even realizing, we both shared a story that was about early education. So from that early point in our education, kindergarten to first grade, right, that these um, moments stood with us, stayed with us, and, and really impacted why we do the work we do. And so um, my, my story comes from being in, in kindergarten, going to first grade. Uh, Spanish is my first language. My mother is an immigrant from El Salvador, from Central America, and she was undocumented until the Immigration Reform and Control Act passed in 1986. It's called, some people refer to it as amnesty. And so at that time, I was in parochial school, so was my younger brother in a Catholic school, and um, it was an English-only school. And so they had decided that they were going to retain me in kindergarten um, until I learned English, but yet they were not providing any like language supports for me. And so my mom took it upon herself, at least this is the version I remember, she took it upon herself to navigate, navigational capital, right? These school, these various schools across the city. And I just remember her driving me to different schools where they would assess me. Um, and I, I knew at that young age, I was five, probably six years old, I knew at that young age that there was a lot of expectations on me um, because my mom was working really hard to get me a solid education. And then the message I got from her is that she was telling the schools that I was smart and they just weren't seeing it. And so that got ingrained with me. And I just remember knowing like, I do, I know I need to learn English, but I'm really smart in math. And, um, and it really came because I got that messaging from my mother. And so she didn't stop. And she found a school, another parochial school that um, that had a bilingual tutor for me. Um, and, and so she just made a big difference for me. And so, um, she did that for my younger siblings who just navigated, you know, anytime that something came up for our education, she was there to advocate for us. And she's always believed in us and messaged to us that we're smart. And that didn't, that wasn't because of what the grades on a report card was. And so, um, to this day, you know, my sister has a master's in social work and we have conversations about how we wouldn't have been able to get this far had our mom not believed in us so much. Um, and this part of education, you know, yes, I'm a first generation um, high school grad. I'm a first generation college grad, first generation faculty. And um, even though I'm first, it isn't because my family doesn't value education. My family has valued education and my aunts um, were teachers in El Salvador. Um, my mom's godmother was a teacher and she kept teaching through the civil war in the 90s in El Salvador um, in her home. It was sort of, you know, the schools were closed. And, and so to me, that's resistant capital. It, it's ingrained in us that my family has struggled for their education. And, and I've been taught not to take it for granted and not to be afraid to speak up if there's something that's not being addressed in education. Uh, so I, I just want to thank her. This is recorded, so I may have to send her this video. So I, I, I want to thank her, you know, and she, um, she really loves when I, when I tell these stories and I think uh, she recognized, she, I don't know if she knew like what the power of she was, what she was doing back then. And so I want her to know that as much as possible. And to this day, she continues to learn. She's taking English classes and she hopes to get her GED one day. Um, and so the picture here is at my PhD graduation in 2016. And uh, I'm pregnant there with my youngest, the, the one in the pink that y'all that y'all saw earlier that I'm holding her. So um, that's that's uh, in May of 2016 at the University of Colorado Boulder, which is where I went to grad school. So I got through that without crying, <laughs> but it was definitely something that you know we wanted to share with you all. And it's uh, very personal for us. Right. I feel like we should, because, you know, we shared our professional background, but what really brings us to this work probably is these inspirational stories from our, from our own mothers who are kind of like a real life counter narrative to what they say sometimes about Black and Latino families and working class families in particular. 
Um, so this photo is kind of like a throwback Thursday photo, except it's Monday, <laughs> because this is from my high school graduation. And, you know, I remember very early on my mom's engagement. And so I was like the, the youngest of three. And I used to be sad that my brother and sister were going to school every day. And I was kind of like not going to school. And so my mom sometimes worked part time. And when she did, I would go to a preschool program, but sometimes she didn't. And I would be at home with her, but she spent a lot of time giving me educational supports at home, just a lot of time. I did a lot of reading and writing and, uh, at home well before I went to kindergarten. So when I went to kindergarten, I was super excited. And my mom tells this story, if she, if she were on, she would tell you this story that I used to honestly get embarrassed by when she would tell every teacher, every professor she'd ever met about <laughs> like this story. But she um, was starting to get a little disenchanted with all of my uh, drawings that I brought home from kindergarten every day. I was like, look, I'm excited. This is what I did today. And she collected them all for about two weeks. And then she went up to the school and she asked to meet with um, my teacher. And she said, you need to give her something more challenging to do. Rhoda can read, Rhoda can write, and she can do more than draw and color. Like she could do this at home. So early on, I had this image of my mom kind of pushing the school to kind of give me what she thought was a more rigorous curriculum. And so oftentimes we think that like parents, especially like my mom who hadn't been to college, really like they, they how could they possibly know what we need? But they, I think she knew me best, right? Um, there's a trope about families and parents as the first teacher, but there's some truth to that. And maybe uh, Veronica, our homeschool mom could really attest to this because for, for, for many years, I watched her um, navigate my elementary school in a way. And this was the importance of neighborhood schools, y'all. Like later, we're going to talk about some work I did in Chicago, where there was a disappearance of neighborhood schools. And the time, you know, that ha has an impact on family engagement practices. But this school was around the corner from my house. My brother and sister went to the school. My mom was well known in the school. She could walk in and everybody would be like, hi, Miss Robinson. Everybody knew her. So I think she had a feeling of comfort and she was welcomed in the space. And so when she raised the concern about the educational kind of pathway I was taking, it was taken seriously, you know, it, it really was. And so I definitely remember, and I also remember a couple of times where I was kind of waiting in the corner for her to finish parent-teacher conference where she was telling these people, call me if anything happens and she's not doing something that she's supposed to be doing. So in a sense, I didn't feel like I could breathe in elementary school, but that was her engagement and it was important. And it set me on a trajectory that I'm on today. And so even though this is a high school photo, um, it, it, it's like probably one of my precious memories. It's like, I was, I was telling Dr. Lopez, I really was looking for other photos of me and my mom, maybe recent ones. And the only ones I could find were us cooking in the kitchen. But, but I think that this is important too. And it speaks to like the different forms of uh, capital that Dr. Lopez was speaking of, um, that she navigated the school and had social capital um, with the existing school staff. And she also um, had aspirational capital for me. She's already thinking about, you're going to college. And I'm like, I'm in kindergarten. I'm sure I thought that. <laughs> but, but the point is that she had plans. And, and without kind of that aspirational capital from my mom, I don't think I would be here either. And I think it's very beautiful how we had these similar kind of narratives about elementary school, our, our mother's being this engaged in the elementary school. So I'm gonna thank you so through. much, Rhoda, for sharing. Yeah, we've we've gotten to work together a lot in the last um since Rhoda got to, to UH a couple of years ago. And we didn't know these things about each other until we sat down and started uh, putting together this presentation. So again, I think uh I thank you all for having us tonight because it helped us to share our stories with each other. And so I want to um now we want to hear from you all. So uh, Rhoda, I'll pass this on to you. 
Yeah, so we we thought we shouldn't just talk at you all day. So we have a couple of moments where we're asking you questions for the chat. And so we'd love to hear what are your own memories of family engagement from your family growing up or even right now um, as you may be raising your family. And then our second question is, what are some experiences with, with family engagement in your current and professional role? I saw in the earlier kind of comment section that a couple of people were like, yes, I want to improve family engagement for my after school program or out of school time learning space. And so we'd love to hear what you're gra grappling with in your professional practice as well. So if you could enter that in the chat um, that we can all learn from one another. And we'll give you a few minutes to think about um... You know, try to peek your memory a little bit if you've, you're comfortable sharing with us. We need some elevator music while we wait. <laughs> Don't be shy. And we should say you can answer either in the chat. You can can lean on your own professional um, kind of experiences with family <laughs> and community engagement. <laughs> Steven is pushing people to, to share. <laughs> and, or you could share your own memories. Maybe they're similar or maybe they're slightly different than what Dr. Lopez and I just shared. I love uh, Ruth Stevens, uh, like mom doing the surprise visits. <laughs> the, I, when I interviewed families in Los Angeles for my, for my thesis work, my dissertation work, there was one parent who said that that's how she liked to engage. She wanted to show up surprised. And there were some organizational challenges for her doing that in California public schools. Wow. Thank you for sharing, Sine. This is like a beautiful kind of memory. Absolutely. About your mother like pushing forward in the face of some serious circumstances. That early education too, that's kindergarten, right? It's, it's early and it really sets the path for, for us as individuals. <laughs> and and, and <laughs> I love that someone else is like, uh, is sharing like, uh, like art education is important too. <laughs> but apparently my mom thought that was happening too much. <laughs> <laughs> and someone else had a similar experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. Incredible. And I love that Dean Schwartz is sharing that his, there's an assumption that they will be going to college. It's like mm -hmm. in the air, you know? Exactly. <laughs> it's like, oh, like, yeah. you, even have, you don't even have to say it too much because the expectations are clear. <laughs> oh, yeah. Both of my kids have parents that have PhDs and they say they're going to get doctorates. And and so I think I, I said I wanted to be a doctor, but I only had the uh, idea of medical doctors, you know, when I was little. And so the fact that they even know that there's a distinction uh, between MDs <laughs> and PhDs is just, it blows my mind. And I love Lizette's comment about the, av the av you know, advocating and navigating these systems that there's, this is such a shared experience, mm -hmm. I think, for, um, you know, first generation um, scholars, especially from communities of color. Um, we, you know. Oh, I Diane, I love this. <laughs> Diane is like, my first grade teacher was also my mother's first grade teacher. Um, 
this is an important point that I think sometimes is lost. And like, again, this, this might come up as a theme if I remember when we are talking about our research later on. <laughs> Couldn't get away with any shenanigans, neither could I. So we appreciate you for you all for sharing um, your, your stories. Um, and I, you know, I think that Veronica, your, your children getting a, being able to attend classes with you is also going to be like Dean Schwartz. They have no choice. <laughs> Absolutely. Yesenia is bringing up really a critical point, which is why we wanted to kind of acknowledge, even though this is an ideal, we wanna see more family and community engagement in, in its most robust forms, but it's, it can be challenging. And so hopefully we can speak to a little bit of this in the future um, portions of this talk, so. Right, right. And I think from the connected back to like the first, a few slides where you talked about involvement versus engagement versus, um, you know, um, I think it was collaboration. And, and so, you know, we in a way want to disrupt these ideas of like, you know, what are the traditional ways that we think about involvement? And, and so right now, especially because of the pandemic, right, it's really important time to, to think about um, what ability do people have, families have to be in schools and how can how um, can schools facilitate that process as well? So we'll be definitely um, asking to talk more about these types of challenges as we go on. Cool, so I think we're ready to keep going. Yeah, thank you everyone for sharing. Uh, really appreciate it. It's like, you know, even though we can only see your words, it feels like we're getting to know you a little bit. So. Absolutely. Um, Rhoda, so, this is yours again. <laughs> okay, this is me. I, I feel like I'm talking too much, but it's okay. No, no, no. <laughs> so we have like a note on key terms because, you know, we're academics and we know we can toss some terms around every now and then that we understand what they mean, but others might not. But we, we wanted to emphasize how important language and words are and descriptions of people and kind of their educational conditions that they um, are operating from. And so um, it's important to note that stereotypical ways of thinking about families and communities really is constrains the families and communities and constrains your ability um, to, to make deep, deeper connections in more thoughtful, robust forms of collaboration. And so when I think about this, um, I often tell my students that, you know, move beyond kind of like one dimensional expectations and portrayals about families, um, particularly the families that, you know, are sometimes labeled, quote unquote, hard to reach, um, which are they hard to reach? Or are there other conditions that make it difficult for them to participate in the way in which we traditionally know uh, or think that parents might or should participate in? So, so you know, there's a complexity that's brought about by thinking about the human condition and intersecting identities. And so some of the words we have here are traditionally thought of as deficit um, language and not very strength-based when thinking about families and communities. And some of the words are trying to honor um, the different ways that parents might show up in your school or program or you know social work space. And so I think it's important to like, have that shared language as we move forward so that we can have a more like collective um, understanding of what the possibilities are. Thank you. Um, and I, I do see a question, so I'll try to address that in, in, the, in the next slide. Um, thank you for that, that explanation, because words do matter. And some of these words, I feel like we, when we were talking, you know, we've heard these um, in doing presentations and working with districts right there. We hear them in our class. And so um, something I, I made the point too to Roto as we were plan planning is that um, language shifts a lot, right, constantly. And so like, even if you look at some of my prior work, I may have been using a term I no longer use. And so, um, and I'm always learning, right? And so 
I think that's part of it too, is that it's fluid um, and, and it's changing, right? Um, we've seen that with discussions, even the term Latinx, um, but that's why we, we think it's really important to state why we're using certain terms. And we might be doing this presentation next year and come up with another term that also, again, tries to be like as inclusive as possible and addressing the assets of communities. So, um, so you've heard us say the word non-dominant a few times already. And, and so we just wanted to give you um, a working definition that we borrow from uh, Dr. Anne Ishimaru, who we've cited a few times. Um, and she says this refers to those impacted by systemic oppression, such as marginalization based on race, class, language, or immigration status, and is a term that explicitly references relationships to dominant power. So at the very beginning, uh, Rhoda mentioned this idea of power, right? And and how certain families uh, have been impacted or you know affected by certain systemic issues, but also like who has power within district, within schools, within communities. Um, and who is, is not recognized, whose power is not recognized. And so um, this is why we're referring to non-dominant families. Uh, we wanted to focus specifically on non-dominant families today for this presentation. Um, that's often who our students ask about, right? When they're saying like, again, to use your term that you, not your term, but the term you just use, like hard, these hard to reach parents, right? The parents that work a lot of jobs, right? Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, there's also stereotypes attached, like parents that don't care as much about education, right? Um, and, and so our what we've done with our role is try to really scrutinize what why we, you know, why these terms are used and also um, have a kind of an open definition of non-dominant. So she, um, you know, it could be based on, it could be communities of color, but it might also be low-income white communities as well. It could be rural uh, low-income communities. And so um, I think that's why we wanted to, to pick a, 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 a term to use for this presentation that, that included all of those populations. So, um, and so- uh, There is a question, a question in the yeah. chat uh, about, um, I hope this answers the question from Onika about, mm -hmm. um, why we use this term, we, we realize there's not a perfect term, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we could go back and forth. Um, even Anne Ishimaru, Dr. Ishimaru in her book talks about, she's not completely satisfied with the term non-dominant, but she thinks it captures best. Um, and, and, you know, is beyond kind of like the notion of minoritized, which is often used. Um, but could this term be viewed negatively? Potentially, but we mean it to frame um, these parents in the current realm, the current social context as being non-dominant, meaning that their perspectives, their viewpoints are often marginalized and not close to the center. Um, and and um, it, it's just a broader umbrella term um, moving beyond just families of color. Yeah, great explanation and a great, again, great question. And so um, I think it's something really, why it's really important to explain these terms when they're used, right? Because they could be interpreted in a certain way. Um, and, and you know, even the term minority, right? Uh, a lot of the districts, and I imagine some of the folks that are here live in districts that are, oh, use air quotes, majority minority. We hear that term a lot. And so they, have majority students of color, right? And so we really try to work with our students and saying, well, is minority really even an accurate term? Because numerically, if, if the majority of the students are Latinx or African-American, Asian, or there's not a majority group, right? Um, then does the term makes numerical sense? So I think, again, just really inviting you all to join us in, in like critically analyzing these terms as we use them, and also just being upfront about what we mean by using them. So. Wanted to just kind of put that out there. And then I'm gonna move on to the next. I'm gonna definitely keep looking at um, looking at the chat here while we're going. So okay. Rhoda's gonna share some of the work that that she did in Chicago. Yes. So um, some some of my work looks at the role of community organizing um, and speaking to kind of uh, hard, difficult decisions that school districts sometimes have to make. So if you work in a school district or you're familiar with a lot of uh, urban school reform lingo, you might have heard that sometimes they have to close schools. Um, and what that does for certain communities is disrupt 
the fabric. So I view schools as part of like a larger social ecosystem. And so um, earlier when I talked about how my mom was fully engaged in my local elementary school, well, that was made in a large part possible by the fact that there was a neighborhood school there, which I grew up on the north side, Kashmir, Trinity Gardens area. That school is no longer there. It is actually closed and has been torn down. But this, this work I did in Chicago looked at kind of shifting neighborhood change and how that impacted local schools. And so you may have heard this is like a big national story around 2012, 2013, where Chicago closed like a record number of schools in one year. And the schools that were closed were primarily in black and Latino communities on the South and West side. And so what it did was bring together a coalition of teachers, um, student groups, parent groups, community-based organizations that are advocacy focused around educational justice issues. It really kind of brought together a citywide coalition of, of folks who were saying, wait a minute, you can't possibly close this many schools in one year. In fact, when I, when I got there and I heard, I was like, oh, there's a list of like a hundred schools that they're talking about closing. That was the earliest iteration of it. And it alarmed the community. And so I went to one community meeting and I was like stunned. It was at a church on the South side and it was packed wall to wall with people who were really, really concerned. And it was like a public forum um, where they had um, representatives from the school district listening, kind of doing a listening tour of community concerns around the school closures. Now they eventually did not close 100 schools. And I think that was large in large part uh, based on community pushback around some of the criteria for closing schools, but they did close 51 or 50 or so. Um, and this was still like, it was, a, it was a months long process where community members got involved. And so part of my work has looked at how can we learn from community organizing and the skills and dispositions of community organizers and advocates and advocates to think about how we engage families and community and kind of like collective engagement. And so this is definitely moving beyond like in involvement, like we were talking about earlier, because in this sense, the, the, the solutions to this challenge that the, the district faced, uh, the community members had us, felt like they should have a say in that. Um, and I think even though the district did have to make that tough decision and close that many schools in one year, it did lay the groundwork, this type of work from families and communities, laid the groundwork for broader um, educational equity-based reforms in the city that might not have come about without these actions from 2012, 2013. So I can look now at the city of Chicago and see that they have made an investment. The Chicago Public Schools has like worked with the federal government and applied for funding for full service community schools that offer, like someone mentioned that they were from wraparound services that offer a more comprehensive approach to engaging communities and in serving the needs of families. Because we, one of the things that I think Dr. Lopez and I wanna make clear is that, you know, schools aren't siloed institutions. They're part of the fabric of a community and families navigate a lot of social institutions and, and, and make connections in their head. And so part of the struggle in Chicago, the pushback that the district felt was based on years and years, like a long history of these communities feeling a little bit disinvested and disenfranchised, like um, losing affordable housing in your community because of gentrification and other market forces that were changing the nature of the community. So then once you see another social institution that you've relied on for so many years come and go, then you don't have the opportunity to have like the same teacher that your first grade teacher had, like someone mentioned early, like your mom had this first grade teacher and you don't get the chance to have that because they closed the schools. And so parent voice collective engagement is a form of um, a, a school of, of family engagement that we would like to see more of. 
But part of the work here and what we want to say near the end and we'll talk about is how to move from kind of this position of critique to offering solutions. And another piece of the work that I don't show here is that I've also written about this hunger strike that went on after 2012, after 2013, um, when they tried to close a school on the South Side and the community felt like they had to go on a 34 day hunger strike to keep the school open. And they worked in conjunction. They didn't just critique the district, they actually worked and developed a plan for how the school could be offering green and technology educational opportunities to local communities. Now they didn't get the green and technology school, they got a, an art space school, but the school remained open. So these kind of sacrifices and efforts from families, youth and community show that they have the capacity to lead on educational equity issues. It's just how much, how much can they do on their own? What's the limit and what are the possibilities of engaging in this type of work. So I, we wanted to share um, a little bit of that. I, I definitely encourage folks to look up more about that Chicago um, hunger strike and the school that they were successful in, in, in keeping, right? And opening with their, own, with their own vision for this school. So thank you for it's really great to have your perspective on this. So um, I'm going to share uh, a little bit about one of the family engagement efforts that I was involved in for uh, three years. So prior to coming to the University of Houston, I was a senior research associate at the Annenberg Institute for School Reform uh, at Brown University. And part of my job was to uh, provide technical support, research evaluation for various projects in the New England area and even actually across the country. So um, I, you know, I've, I've always kind of been involved with youth work, even as a, as a youth, former youth leader myself, um, as well, and, um, uh, valued collaborating with youth and families and, uh, you know, where my, um, English, uh, where my Spanish language was not seen as an asset early in my education, my bilingual, um, my, my ability to biling to navigate bilingual environments, Spanish and English has definitely been something that's allowed me to maximize my engagement with with uh, families, and especially with you know, Latinx immigrant families. And so in this project, I was, um, a, I would say I was a bilingual evaluator. So not just any, uh, you know, evaluators where I can go in and like sit into focus groups with parents and really hear um, what their perspective was on education and how the schools were engaging them, how the teachers were engaging them, what they wanted for their children. And so this was a grant that was given by the Department of Education, um, an I-3 grant to engage families. Um, I don't think it's in existence anymore, but I know there's several other family engagement grants. So it was a longitudinal study and uh, mixed methods. And so we really um, wanted to hear from various stakeholders, from the teachers, from the administrators, from the parents and uh, parent collaborators that they were able to hire with the grant. And it was in Central Falls, Rhode Island, which is a one square mile urban city uh, in Rhode Island. And it's uh, about, I think 70 something percent uh, immigrant families, super diverse. And so uh, even though it's only one square mile, which is hard to believe in a place like Houston, uh, that there's cities that exist that are that small. Uh, it was really, uh, I think that really interesting place to focus on, especially they were actually one of the first districts that um, had experiences with turnaround. And so um, early on, you know, before when that was just starting to be to be a thing. And I, I think about um, Mary's question about how do we provide like ongoing um, training uh, from earlier in the chat um, to to leaders around engagement. And so this grant actually provided that opportunity where it had training embedded for the leaders um, for teachers. And so one of the things that they had was, um, it was called incredible years training. And so what they wanted to do was um, have children, have parents, whether you were a Spanish speaker, English speaker, have teachers, all have, and, and, and families have shared language around positive behavior. And so if a teacher was engaging a child and they were um, starting to use the words from this training, the different skills from this training practices, I guess I should say, then the children could also, if the parents were engaging in the same training, the children were hearing it from both the families and um, from their parents and from the teachers. So that was a positive aspect of this. Um, and 
they really, the parents had really amazing things to say about this. One of the other aspects that was really successful was having parent collaborators within the schools. These were um, a Head Start um, and an a elementary school and an early um, childhood center. And so um, the parent collaborators worked in the parent room. So you see one of the photos here of one of the parent uh, rooms and the project was We Are a Village, Parents Are Power. So again, like we've been talking a lot about power, right? So in this way, like this project really, it was guided by um, Yaso's uh, framework and like, what is the, what are the strengths that these families bring? And one of the ways to recognize that, um, promising way to recognize that is by having bilingual collaborators that are paid by the district. You also have parent leaders that were paid a stipend as well to engage other parents um, because they knew, you know, they were their neighbors, right? And so they could, they're an asset to these schools. And so they talked to us about how uh, much it meant to them to have a space within the school where they can come and do activities, um, do um, volunteer work for the school to also get resources. You know, if there was a need um, for like rental assistance or they needed help uh, applying for some kind of service, they knew that they could come to the parent collaborator and get assistance with that. Um, and then what, but you know, we also noted challenges, right? And one of the challenges was that sometimes the cultural wealth of the immigrant families was not recognized by the teachers. And so, um, you know, they kind of wanted to know why are all these teachers here? Why are all these parents here all the time, right? They're, they're kind of getting in the way. And I see, you know, I think some of us uh, in the chat had some similar experiences, right? Where maybe our parents showed up and they're not always welcome, right? Uh, but through the life of the grant, through the intervention over years, some of these teachers changed their mind, right? And they, and they started to see uh, no, you know, I do see why they're here, why they're in the school, and, and I value the contribution that they're making. So, um, you know, I think some of, there was a lot of various um, differences, right, in the, in, in, I would say the cultural schooling, and so the grant and the intervention helped them align in that. So, um, that was, I was excited to be part of that project, and, and so we'll share the report and different, it has, um, the report has different tips on sort of like how to do this kind of work. And the second picture that I have here, it was hard to, I, I know Rod and I had a few, you know, projects that we were, it took us down memory lane to talk about different examples, you know. Um, I, I was also part of an extended learning time project and really thinking about ways, to, how do we imagine the school day? How do we imagine after school, right? Um, so that it's enriching. I think in terms of equity, it's something that has been noted that Schools that have less resources spend more time, you know, on teaching to the test and that sort of thing. Maybe there's been a defunding of like arts programs, of music, of enrichment kind of, um, you know, there's just a lack of funding in, in a lot of education. And, and unfortunately, that's where the non-dominant piece rate, these non-dominant communities. And so what are some ways to like reimagine time in school? If it's a, an issue of equity of the way that time is being used in school, how can we reimagine it? And so here you see it's a, a, when we were in Boulder as a team working with this organization uh, who was then called Padres y Jóvenes Unidos or Parents and Youth United in Colorado. It's a um, nonprofit organization that has a long civil rights history. Actually, um, the founders, I think, started by doing immigrant rights work here in Houston area and then moved to Colorado. Now it's called Movimiento Poder. And what they're, they've been really instrumental in uh, disrupting the school to prison pipeline and really um, getting the dis, uh, Denver schools to adopt restorative justice practices. And in, at this moment here, we were talking about extended learning time. And so they, um, we helped them as they were collecting data about um, they went door to door, they had a survey and they were um, surveying families about, you know, how they want to see time, um, the, the school day designed. And so here we work together. You see here professors from the University of Colorado. You see the researchers at Annenberg Institute uh, there. Uh, you see uh, community organizers and you see us working in a room, right, with these charts around and uh, it's trying to uh, um, make sense of the data that they collected. So we work together, right? And I think that that's one of the points we want to bring home today, too, is that it doesn't have to be done alone. It doesn't have to be done in a silo. And in that place, like the community organization was really um, we, you know, they were telling us what we should be doing. Right. And, and so we want to recognize like as researchers that we do have power in certain spaces, right? And, and so really recognizing our privilege. So recognizing my privilege there and how can I be an asset to this space in order to support 
what we all wanted to support, which was educational equity. And that picture on the left, you see uh, Dolores Huerta, who is a historic, uh, just giant in the civil rights movement in the Latino community and the farm workers union. And so she just happened to be speaking in Boulder on that day and we ran into her at a restaurant. So I had to, I had to put that photo in there for uh, just to, to remember that, that, you know, like the, she's, I think 90 years old now and she's been doing this work, engaging communities uh, for a long time. She's a mother of 12 and, um, I, you know, I think a lot of the work that we're talking about has these roots. Um, it can happen because of people like her that have um, led the way. Back to you. I really, I really can't. I mean, so we may, we have students read um, one of the pieces from that project that, that Dr. Lopez just discussed, and it really resonates with them th thinking about concepts like mutual trust and um, how do you operationalize community cultural wealth, which feels conceptual and theoretical, but can be used and applied to thinking about family and community engagement. And it really was a popular piece in my class this, this, this term. Um, so now we wanna move on to talking about a couple models that, uh, that we um, have been discussing in our class, but that offer some more tools um, and resources for people to think about how to uh, effectively um, roll out partnerships between educators and families. And so this is a very popular uh, framework by Karen Mapp, who's a scholar practitioner at Harvard. And um, this framework is actually used in a number of places in, by the federal government, for some of their family and community engagement work. But it's also like I've in, in learning more about the Houston context since we both worked in other areas, um, I, I've come across at least one school district that's using this at the district level around their family and community engagement work. And I was thoroughly impressed that <laughs> they were uh, fully uh, sold on this dual capacity framework. And what it does is kind of lays out the challenge, which is, hey, educators are in one space, families are in another, how do we bridge this kind of gap? Well, they both have work to do to, to understand each other's context. And so that's why they call it a dual capacity framework. But what um, some of my students said they love about it is that it's not just to talk about this idealistic way of engaging families without talking about the critical conditions that exist in schools and outside of schools that may sometimes make this work challenging. And so to address that, um, you know, Karen Mapp and her colleagues talk about these uh, program goals. And, and some of these goals are, are, are linked to kind of like uh, skills and dispositions that could help both families and educators improve and come to more equitable partnerships. So, if you've never heard of this framework before, you, it might resonate with you as you're starting to think about kind of creative ways, some best practices. And this framework is really research-based, um, just like um, the, the other one we wanna recommend that you learn more about. Um, so in the next slide, um, I can't remember if I'm talking about this, I guess. Um, yes, this is uh, families and educators co-designing solutions. So we've talked a lot, like I, a lot of my work looks at like parents and community members saying, aha, this is a problem <laughs> and critiquing the system. But how do we move beyond the critique to develop something that is real and meaningful that shifts practice and, and education and provides more robust educational opportunities for, for young people? Um, I don't think anybody, I mean, okay, maybe there's some educators out there, I haven't met them yet, that don't um, want to see their students thrive and, and achieve big things. Um, I know that some people say there's some educators like that. Most people, though, aren't going into the profession <laughs> to hem our kids up. <laughs> so with that in mind, parents and families and, and communities and and educators and administrators actually have a lot in common. And so 
um, they can be powerful allies in the push towards educational equity. And so what this co-design process that Dr. Ishimaru, I know we've mentioned her name several times, but she her work really is on the cutting edge of the field in terms of thinking about ways to um, develop more equitable collaborations between these, these different groups. And the work that she's done is definitely research-based where she's actually centered the concerns of families and communities. And then they work in conjunction with educators to co-design solutions to some of the big uh, challenges and educational challenges that we see in schools. And this, this process is not for the faint of heart, I would say. But I think that there's a lot of promise in this because of the results that they've been able to achieve in some of the communities that she looked at that have engaged this process. And so this photograph is from one of the co-design sessions with families in the Pacific Northwest who were working on some critical issues that they identified that were essential to address and educators taking, taking up that work in conjunction with them. And if you want to, we have the link to that, but this book, um, Just Schools, is an excellent kind of um, dissecting of this process. And she kind of walks you through how you move from this space of, hey, critique, I've had bad experiences with the school and the community, and um, how you move from the space of critique to something more productive and more meaningful and more and more uh, long lasting, where you're co-creating the solutions to some of the challenges. I should say our students are reading this book now. It's the first time we've used this book in the classes we've taught and um, it's, it's, it's going well. Yes, yes. I hadn't had a chance to read it until this semester that we started using it. I'm just learning a lot. It's, um, it brings up really great, rich conversations. So um, we're going to have a time in a, in a couple of slides. We're getting to the near the end of our presentation. And so in a minute, we're going to open it up for just general questions. And uh, But we wanted to spend a few minutes here um, talking, hearing from you all again in the chat. Um, what are some challenges to this kind of work, you know, to do if you're as a, you know, a leader in a school or in a district, um, if you're working in the community, if you're a parent, you know, what are the challenges that you've um, encountered in doing family engagement work? And so we just wanted to spend a little bit of time on that. And I know I, I saw one already at the beginning, so I kind of wanted us to bring to come back to that one as folks are thinking about what to type. Let's see if I could scroll up to <laughs> find it again. I think it was the one about like that there's so many um, struggles, right? That that people yeah. are I see encountering it. This right now. Parent engagement has been a challenge with our program. Nice. Families are dealing with a lot of other issues that affect their ability to participate and be involved. Yeah, do you wanna, um, we could take this, this, these slides on together, these comments together, Rhoda. Is there anything that you would respond to that one? Yeah, I think, um, you know, just a, as a reminder, we've been trying to, we hope we're challenging you to think beyond um, the traditional paradigms of what would count as engagement. Um, these relationship building activities are important so that you could get to the heart of maybe why some families can't engage in the way that we lay out in schools and in, in some of our programming, but they might be able to engage in another way, a more robust way, if there were structures and opportunities in place for them to do so. And so it's it's kind of like, um, it's definitely a challenge. I'm, I'm not trying to minimize the the challenges that are faced when you're just trying to get them to, to, to be engaged with some of, the, some of the practices. But I think we will sometimes have to think outside of the box when we have non-dominant families that we are, uh, I hate when people say think outside of the box. What does that mean? Um, <laughs> but you know, it's like we, we do have to, to challenge our thinking about whether this is the best way to engage these families, if they have these other challenges. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that 
you know, we now know is that if you don't have babysitting at some of your uh, meetings, that some parents can't come because they can't watch the, all of their kids and be engaged in your meeting. Or And so when we were in Chicago and we were doing organizing work with families and communities, we uh, there was a there was a babysitting co-op that where college students would come and in a different room, <laughs> your children were being entertained and fed while you were actually engaging in the work of, uh, of community building with other families, more collective forms of engagement. And we had to shift our mindset and practice in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the child care one. And then there's also you know, I want to kind of bring it back to structural issues too. Like, you know, if we're in a anti-immigrant climate, um, there's families that, you know, if you come to the school, you have to show your ID, if, if you have to show your ID to come in um, or even to sign up right through, I know for HIC, you have to sign up online and, and there's other ways, you know, there's ways to volunteer, even if you are, have unauthorized immigrant status, um, but making that known, right, um, to the school, because inadvertently um, a, a parent, an immigrant um, unauthorized parent who doesn't have um, documentation may be dissuaded from participating, even though if they have the time to be involved in the school. So um, what are some ways that, that are messaging, you know, that are messaged to the families that everyone is welcome and that you don't need documentation to be able to, you know, chaperone uh, children on a field trip or um, come volunteer in a classroom. Uh, so I think child care, meals, I mean, it's, uh, I think for something we saw too, and um that's been a, a promising practice is just having providing meals right like people are coming during dinner time and um and so another thing we've heard i think in our classes is that having a zoom option has been really life-changing <laughs> because um like parent conferences for example you know um sometimes families feel pressure to take a half a day off work or have to because so that they can be there at a parent conference but if there's a zoom parent conference then they could just step to the side and, and join parent conference that way for 15 minutes. So, you know, again, it's also about access um, in, in thinking about engagement. There's a couple more comments here. So um, another challenge has been getting all stakeholders on board and coming to consensus. Yes. <laughs> yes. And something um, we talk about in our doctoral class about um, uh, public relations classes about buy-in. Like, how do you get buy-in? How do you really ensure you're having two-way communication? So not just like, you know, institutions um, communicating to, um, for example, to families, you know, what's going on, but really listening to everybody. So buy-in uh, and then how does it, how does an um, ownership get created of, of efforts? So is there anything else you want to say about that one, Linda? No, I just would say uh, it's not lost on me ever that you would say this because part of what I'm interested in is like, elevating many, many voices. And what's the challenge in that is the coming to consensus because, because democracy is great, but democracy is messy, it's difficult and it's complex and, and hard to pull off. And so these type of stakeholder kind of engagement practices definitely take time um, and coming to consensus, you might not ever <laughs> come to a mm -hmm. true consensus, yeah. but you might have more voices satisfied than fewer if you have a robust uh, public and community engagement process, especially around key decisions that educational professionals have to make. Um, I guess, do we I have- I feel like Terrence Green's, Terrence Green's work is really important Absolutely. here with community equity audit. So I think yeah. we have him on our resource page. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, we, I think we have, um, let's go, uh, I see the one about, um, did you want to address one of them that the one stand up to you? No, I just wanted to acknowledge that Veronica was saying that yeah. some some people don't even want. <laughs> and it's, yeah. you know, one thing I, I did some interviews in California when I lived there with principals about family engagement. And they they talked about wanting more of that, but they also talked about the demands of their job and how the principalship has changed over time. And there's like, you're expected to be experts in budget. You're expected to be experts in all these different domains, um, an instructional leader. And now you want me to fully engage family and communities too. It's just a lot to ask. And so sometimes educators and administrators want it, but how, how to make it manageable with the finite amount of time. That's, 
that some of the feedback I've gotten from, mm-hmm. from school leaders is that it's, it's, it's definitely something they desire, but how to navigate that. And not everybody has the ability to hire like liaison or community staff who can, who can facilitate that for a school. But if you can, that's, that's the best way to go. If you got some resources, <laughs> that's mm-hmm. the best way to, to go about it, to get the support you need. Um, to 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 advance these kind of ideals we've laid out. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think you covered uh, both um, uh, Ronica and Mary's comments there, and I think another piece about um, seeing the value, right? Like, I want to underline that. Like, how do you see the value of? Um, I think you're talking in terms of leaders and staff, right? To um, right. to. Um, prioritize authentic family engagement and seeing the value. And I think one of the pieces that, you know, we've mentioned research, of course, um, there's other ways to, I think, uh, justify some of the work that's happening. That's why this work is really valuable. But I think something that I've discussed with my classes is at the end of the day, like the research is showing that this has positive implications for academic outcomes, right? And so I know, unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, uh, that that speaks a lot, Um to stakeholders, to policymakers, to leaders. And so um, I think showing that, showing the benefits, right, of, of this work. And again, I can't underscore it enough, but collaborating, not, not feeling like you have to do it away again. And then there's a there's a shout out to your reframing of the outside the box um, uh, language. And um, so, uh, we'll, so that school leaders will need support um, with being able to hear the information from parents in ways that do not center the dominant community. So yeah, that's a really, really important one too. Thank you all so much for engaging. Oh, go ahead. Important takeaway. <laughs> yes. Up oh, there's another comment. Oh, there's like some great ones. Oh, some too. engagement between Let's, uh, yes. <laughs> Mary and Ber- People Armani. are thinking. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Funding greater capacity, and you mentioned that, right? Like some people may not have money to right to hire a liaison, right? Mm-hmm. This is such an important one. We were just talking yeah. about my about this in my class. There's a school. Um, there's the community schools model, right? Community right. schools model that have that individual that's com- that's their job, right, to be a liaison for the community. Yeah, and some there are some. There is some research about parent leadership models, and I'm looking at the last comment from Sandra. There's some some research out of Chicago, it's not mine, but where some folks have looked at this neighborhood group that has a history of having like a parent leader um, model where they can, you know, train, they train the next generation of parent advocates and parent leaders in their local community. And I um that is one way to help um, fam- families, you know, feel more empowered and feel feel as if they have a space and a seat at the table. Um, and there are also some structural things you can do. Like, I, you know, I, I don't know all of the ins and outs of the different school districts and whether or not you have student and parent and family voice spaces. But in Chicago, there were these entities called local school councils. Um, I used to sit on one in my own neighborhood as a community member. And that was a pretty powerful group that had to be led by a parent. And that's like in state education code in Chicago, in the state of Illinois. And so local school councils literally have the ability to make decisions about budgets in conjunction with the principal. They actually can help uh, hire principles in those spaces. And um, that's a way that they are building in voice and decision-making power among families and community members and teachers as well, because teachers are, they have teacher representatives on local school councils. So it's not just, you know, the hero narrative of one principal so it's saving an entire school, school and community, but it's kind of like a more democratic engagement. And I don't know mm-hmm. if their mechanisms similar, maybe they're not as powerful, or maybe they're more advisory in nature in the <clears throat> local Houston context, but I'm interested in learning more about them. Mm-hmm. School decision-making community uh, uh, yes. uh, committees. 
Thank you. Thank you for, I, I didn't realize I was unmuted. So you heard me agreeing <laughs> with you. So, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Um, thank you for sharing that model. And, um, and thank you all for the engagement in the chat. I, I keep saving the chat because I want to go back after the session and uh, we're going to give our contact information. And again, it's really great to see um, some familiar faces. I see the comment from um, Armando Orduña and he's with Latinos for Education and has been doing some great work with Latino family engagement here in the Houston area as well. So, um, you know, I think in this room today we have, um, you know, if we were in the same room together, I'm sure we would be writing on whiteboards and like coming up with different <laughs> plans. So maybe I'm putting something out there for the vi a vision for the future, you know, that we have a convening on, on family engagement and get all of us in a room. Uh, to talk about this, but we're going to start um, wrapping up in the next few slides and just kind of wanted to bring some points home again. And so um, enacting family engagement. So one thing we want to underscore is, you know, begin with concerns of families, including youth and the broader community. You know, I, th I think that's something that, again, we, we I think Dr. Annie Shimaru really um, does well with her book is expanding our vision of like, why do we use the word family? Family um, you know, parents in a way, um, maybe, maybe limiting some families, so who some right. families are, maybe some families are led by a abuelita, by a grandmother, you know, or by a tío, a tía, an aunt, an uncle, an older sibling, um, maybe fa family to someone is their next door neighbor, right, a community leader, and so by using the word family, we're including, um, we're disrupting sort of this traditional idea, um, and youth, including youth in there too, right, so um, and then hearing what their concerns are. So um, again, I want to underscore that, especially right now, given that uh, we're dealing with so many intersecting uh, injustices at the same time, and then um, and challenges. So and also acknowledge unique knowledge and expertise of families. We've talked about that a lot. Uh, we're going to assign Dr. Yasso's, uh, Terry Yasso's <laughs> article um, that'll really give us a, a framework. And, and I really encourage you to even look at people that have used your work because other people have said, you know, acknowledging the spiritual capital, the religious capital, mm -hmm. the role of, you know, uh, churches and communities too, and uh, what they bring to, to, to schools, um, the resources that they provide sometimes. And then also um, cultivating a school culture and environment that welcomes family input. I think that's been part of the, conversation in the chat too, right? Um, even starting with our stories. Um, and then share, share power through opportunities for collective and democratic decision-making. You saw Dr. Rhoda Freeland just like uh, took that point, you know, uh, talked about that point a second ago, right? And 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 so really, um, you know, so how do we, I think it's that idea of like the comment that was made about bringing all the stakeholders on board, right? And so that plus where you responded about the democratic process. So just how important that is. And it is, I want to underscore what you've been saying that this is hard work, that it's yeah. not easy. And I think the next slide <laughs> captures that really well. <laughs> yeah, so I asked, I asked her if I could share this, uh, this visual uh, note-taking from a meeting that I was co-hosting in Chicago. Um, with the Chicago Public Schools and a research founder in a local group of academic researchers about how we engage educators, students, families, and communities in actual research. Like we've been talking about practice-related uh, discussions today, practice-related issues, but how do you engage them in research? But I think it's parallel. I think there's a lot of parallels to this, this graphic about what we would like to see and how you might start with um, centering the big questions that families and community members have. Um, there's a whole body of work on participatory research design and community-based participatory research um, that Dr. Lopez and I have soft spots in our heart for that really are kind of important ways to, to advance kind of like this equity agenda and explore the dimensions of equity. And why, why wouldn't it be powerful if we involve families and communities and young people in that shared collective work. And it, it really does. Now, now, we've been talking about disrupting practice-based, you know, paradigms, but this, this disrupts the academy, in a sense, when you center families and communities. And I forgot to add this to our resource list, uh, an article, a book chapter that I co-wrote with a community member about uh, equitable communities, how we move towards more equitable communities. And this, it's, a, it's a story and a narrative about the leadership practices 
of um, a mother from Chicago and how she went from like single mom, you know, on a local school council and became parent organizer into the city. And now she's a city council member. Um, what can we learn from her trajectory as a parent engaged in um, advocacy work on behalf of her children throughout those years and how she ended up connecting those, those, those dots. So to, to broader social issues and social justice um, efforts in the city of Chicago. And so I like this graphic, it's chaotic, but it speaks to all of the different dimensions of educational equity we should be caring about in centering educators and students and families and communities in that endeavor. So. Well, thank you, Dr. Lopez and Dr. Freeland. So, wow, this was this was uh, this was amazing. Does any does anyone have any questions before we sign off? I think if you uh, can put your contact information, I know I'm sure people are going to want to contact you. And you know what? I'm yeah. I'm just speaking off the cuff here, but I think it will be great to have a family engage uh, to host a family engagement conference. Well, Absolutely. we can bring a whole bunch of people together and really sort of hash out in person uh, some details. I think that would be a great idea. Love it. <laughs> Expect the call from me. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And all the attendees have to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're situated, you know, where UHD is, UH campus, like, um, you know, a lot of the work that, that Rhoda is doing, um, which is in the third ward and I'm over here in the East End, it's, there's so much, there's just, and, you know, we're teaching out in Fort Bend and Sci Fair, so I really think there's an opportunity to bring together um, all these, reach, these resources and families too, you know, like bringing families uh to the table with us. I think it would be really wonderful. I, if you uh, scan this QR link with your phone, you'll be able to see the resources that we put together for you all. And um, and then um, I'm sure if you email us, I wanna get, I wanna read that chapter two, <laughs> Dr. Freeland that you mentioned. So like if uh, there's our email, our email addresses are actually hyperlinked at the top of that document. So you can definitely reach out. Um, but I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, Stephen. thank you. Um, Dean Schwartz um, for having us, for giving us the space to talk about something that we're really, really passionate about um, and that, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out as we go too. So I really appreciate um, you all allowing us to share a little bit of our journey and to also learn while we did for allowing us to learn about, you know, more about what we've done together. And, um, and we want to continue learning and hearing your stories too. So I hope this wasn't the last time that we get to chat. Dr. Freeland? Absolutely. I just wanted to thank the audience because they they were so um, engaged and really, I really appreciated hearing about the challenges, but also some of the, the ideas that people have about this work. So, yeah, I'm all in for the conference. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Fall 2022. It's coming. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank now thank everyone you. who's on um, this. This presentation will be on our YouTube page in about a week and a half. So uh, if you need to uh, reference it back, you'll be able to see it there. So again, Dr. Freelon, Dr. Lopez, thank you so much for your time tonight and putting together this presentation. We will see you again in the future. Good night, everyone.